Well, if you turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 3, we were looking at verses 16 to 18 last time. Um, this, is a, this is a particularly great passage. Uh, it's one of the first ones that in the book that really has been a passage of comfort. And we're, we're going to see that as we look at it. Verse 16 says, Then it shall come to pass, when you are multiplied and increased in the land in those days, says the Lord, that they will say no more. Here. Three, Jeremiah 3.16 yeah. Do you have one of these, you guys? No. This is the last one right here. Three to the north? Yes. Maybe go Let me go right up. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, this, this whole paragraph goes together, of course, but uh, then it shall come to pass. That, that's kind of telling us we're looking at a prophecy. We are looking at a prophecy. When you are multiplied and increased in the land, what does that mean, you think? <laughs> Pretty simple, really. Lots of children. They're going to they're gonna increase. Remember like they did in Egypt when uh, Israel went down to Egypt? And they multiplied and grew in numbers to the point where the Egyptian government, Pharaoh, and probably his advisors were afraid that they were going to revolt and uh, perhaps take over Egypt. Why? Because they had multiplied so much, they became so numerous that they were they became a threat to the Egyptian Empire, and that's part of the reason that we have the oppression that we had uh, back in that time and why they were crying out to the Lord and ultimately uh, why the, the exodus took place. So it's a similar statement here that they will increase in land. And remember uh, that uh, the Lord is talking to Israel, about Israel. They're, they're gone. They've been in exile now for uh, well over 100 years. And uh, most of, of the northern kingdom, most of those tribes disappeared. But the Lord says, nevertheless, when you have multiplied and increased in the land, says the Lord, uh, they will say no more, the ark of the covenant of the Lord, it shall not come to mind, nor shall they remember it, nor shall they visit it, nor shall it be made anymore. So there's coming a time in those days Whenever those days are, we'll try to talk about that as we go. Try to figure out what those days might mean. But the first thing he talks about is they will say no more the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. Why do you think that Jeremiah or the Lord, as he inspires Jeremiah to write, why do you think that he's saying that? They will say, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. Yes, the significance of the Ark of the Lord is that it is a symbol in the holiest of holies in the temple or in the tabernacle under Moses before, before they built the temple. It is in the, the Ark of the Covenant is in the Holy of Holies. Do you remember what is in it? I heard manna. Somebody say manna. Moses' staff. And the Ten Commandments. Later on, there's some evidence that they put tablets, I mean, not tablets, but scrolls of the law into the Ark of the Covenant. But why were people saying the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant? Why would they even be saying such a thing? Remember the presumption that we've talked about several times? That when we have, we are the chosen people of God. We live in the chosen land of God. We have the chosen city of God, Jerusalem. 
We have the chosen place of God, the temple. We have the Ark of the Covenant inside the holiest of holies, inside the temple. Nothing can touch us. Nothing can destroy us. So one of the things they cried out was, you know, they said, the, the temple, the temple, the temple, the ark, the ark, the ark, the land, the land, the land. All of these things were symbols of God's presence with them and signs of God's presence with them. And they thought they could presume on those things in spite of the idolatry and the immorality that they'd all gotten caught up in. It's like somebody saying, who's not a believer in a courtroom, I swear to God that I'm telling you the truth. So the swearing on the ark, the ark of the covenant of the Lord, full title of the ark there. So they were using the ark of the covenant as sort of a, a talisman or something like that to make it a, the, the thing that uh, uh, they, they had confidence in that it would protect them as long as the covenant of the ark, or the ark of the covenant was there, then they would be protected. As long as they held the temple, they would be, they would be protected, and so on. So there's coming a day when they won't say that anymore. Why not? Hmm? Yeah, the temple was going to be destroyed. It wasn't destroyed yet. But it would be. Remember, we talked about. Yes, Raina. Oh, oh, Raina, I'm sorry. Yes. Yes, that's that's a hint. That's a hint about when this is supposed to take place. Remember, we talked about it numerous times. That the northern kingdom up here, this green area, is gone. It belongs to the Assyrian Empire at the time that Jeremiah is giving this prophecy. It's a province of the Assyrian Empire. Uh, but the Babylonians are on the move. They will destroy the Assyrian Empire, and ultimately they will attack Judah, and they will destroy Jerusalem. And in 586 BC, Jerusalem was destroyed. The temple was destroyed. The bulk of the population by that time had been exiled to Babylon and the surrounding cities. So at that time, the ark disappears. Nobody knows precisely what happened to it. The Bible doesn't tell us. But the time that Jeremiah is looking forward to here for the people of Israel is when the ark won't come to mind. They won't even think of it. I had asked you a, a couple of things here and some questions in these notes. Uh, uh, well, I just the, the ark. Anyway, I didn't I didn't ask that question about the three things that uh, or four things that it says about the ark that won't come to mind. I won't even think of it anymore. Why not? Because the Lord's going to be present with him Himself. That's at the time at that time Jerusalem and it goes on. Uh, this appears to mesh a lot, a great deal with Revelation. Then it won't even occur to them that it's a problem. It won't come to mind, nor will they remember it. That's virtually the same thing, saying the same thing two different ways. They're not going to think of it. They won't remember it. They won't need to. Nor shall they visit it. it doesn't exist. Or they can't. And nor shall it be made anymore. They won't re remake an ark. Of the covenant when the when this restoration takes place. But what the ark is in Jerusalem now. It is. Oh, okay. At the time Jeremiah is writing this prophecy, you mean now, now, today? Yeah. No, no, no. We don't have the ark disappeared. We don't know what happened. This uh, probably the Babylonians took it and destroyed it. But. It doesn't exist today. I thought you meant today when Jeremiah was writing. I apologize. So, but but at the time Jeremiah was writing, it did exist. It was there in the temple, up on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. But he's telling them there's coming a time when it won't be, and you won't remember it. You won't care about it. 
I'm not going to remake it. It won't need to be remade. Why not? Well, we'll look at that in a minute. Look at verse 17. At that time, Jerusalem will be called the throne of the Lord. And all the nations will be gathered to it. What does that remind you of, Raylene? What does that remind you of? That the Jerusalem itself will be called the throne of the Lord and all the nations will be gathered to it. Yes, during the millennial kingdom, it, we, we have something similar to that said in the book of Revelation. That the nations will be streaming to the city of Jerusalem. But remember at that point that uh, the Lord ultimately uh, heaven is going to come down and meet with earth at Jerusalem and the new heavens and the new earth will be, will be formed, whatever. Isn't there the Ark of the Covenant going to reappear not that I know of. Okay. And I'm understanding it, I thought it was really simple. Well, there's there's a lot of iffy things about, and a lot of speculation about what's going to occur in those days. But that's not real clear about the art, because that's the only reason I got it. Well, there's a, there's a lot of things taught about these last days that really are speculation. One thing speculated, and then it's accepted as a truth, and the next thing speculated. And uh, there's just a lot of things that aren't real clear. Now, some teachers teach things that as if they're crystal clear. And they're not always crystal clear. Well, Isaiah 
leaves just goes up and leaves. There's, there's a symbolic leaving in the, in the book of uh, Ezekiel. So uh, it was just done. The, the, the city was done. But it, that's why it's so traumatic when you, when you read about what happens here. Now, stop to think about what this means in Jeremiah's day. The ark is there. Nobody sees it because it's in the Holy of Holies. Only, only the high priest goes in once a year when they do the, on the Day of Atonement and sprinkles it with the blood of the sacrifice. That's the only time anybody went in there, and that was just once a year. And that Ark of the Covenant was there, and that's where they sprinkled the blood on the Ark. And it was to, to, to show the presence of God with the people and to show their commitment to the covenant. And... Uh, but that is still there when Jeremiah is writing this. Can you can you imagine? The Ark of the Covenant is going to be no more. We're not even going to remember it or think about it. We'll restore it. This was a shock. This would like be like I mean it would even be worse than uh, than saying uh, Washington D.C. the Capitol building. The White House, psh, gone. I mean, the heart of the nation. And this is even worse. The only parallel that I can think of in the, among the Ashanti people in Ghana, they had what they called the golden stool. These stools were, were chair-like things. I've got the, some models of them at home, but they were chair-like things that the, that the kings sat on. And the Ashantis had one that was made of pure gold. You can imagine what that thing weighed. But they believed that that was sent straight from heaven down to the Ashanti people. Now it was not just a it was not just the gold that made it valuable, far from it. What they believed was that the soul of the nation resigned, uh, lived, exactly. lived in the stool. That the actual soul of the nation was there. The collected souls of all the people were represented in that golden stool. So for that golden stool to disappear, it would be, it would be just like destruction of the, of the people themselves. It would be like a genocide, just wiping everybody out. The British tried to take that golden stool. They didn't get it. Every Ashanti in the, in the, in the country would have died first before they would let the British colonizers take it. That golden stool is still somewhere. But if, the, if it was destroyed, it, it would tantamount to the destruction of the nation itself. Now, all that is myth. Not the existence of an actual golden stool, but the soul of the nation being in it and all of that. But that's what they believed. And uh, they would have fought to the last man to keep that golden stool from getting into anybody's hands, anybody else's hands. Because the British would have taken it off to the British Museum. And uh, it had to stay in Asante land. Uh, Asante was. It would be similar to the Ark. If the Ark were gone, that would be that would mean that uh, that uh, the temple was destroyed, the Ark was destroyed, the city was destroyed, the nation was destroyed. And that is exactly what happened. So when when Jeremiah says that uh, you're not going to renew the ark, you just nobody's going to say the ark of the covenant anymore. It shall not come to mind, or anybody remember it, nor shall they visit it, nor shall it be made anymore. Uh, that was a horrible prophecy. It is actually a prophecy of the destruction of the nation. But in the context. It's positive because the Lord is bringing the people back. He's going, to, he's going to call them his own people again. Jerusalem is going to, to still stand, and Jerusalem itself is going to be called the throne of the Lord, the place where the Lord resides and the presence of God is experienced. And all the nations are going to stream, gather, be gathered to it, to the name of the Lord, to Jerusalem. That's going to happen one day. It sounds like the millennial kingdom. Now, I'm not willing to die for that. 
because prophecies have a way of, of uh, being fulfilled, sometimes extremely literally, and sometimes in a more figurative sense. But it sounds to me like this is the millennial kingdom and the events associated with eternity as well. Because it, it tells us in Revelation that the nations are going to be streaming to Jerusalem, coming to Jerusalem, bringing their offerings. Uh, most of us uh, tend to think that the final destination of Christians is heaven. That's not really true. Our final destination is not heaven. We go to heaven when we die now, in between, but one day in the Old Testament, in Isaiah, in, in, in Revelation, other places, there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. The Lord is going to, most scholars think that this earth is going to be burned over and recreated by God to be like it was intended to be. And he's not only going, you know, remember Pastor talked about this one time when he was talking about uh, Romans 8, where the whole of creation is groaning for the redemption of the sons of God. Because the whole creation is going to be restored. Remember, there was a curse put on it in the garden after Adam and Eve fell. And there was a curse put on the ground itself. And that is going to be, the earth itself is going to be redeemed one day. And we're going to live in eternity as physical beings resurrected from the dead and live in the new heavens and the new earth. The heavens and the earth will merge. And it says there's a new heaven. Is, is heaven hell that we would think of now, is that also destroyed? The reason I ask is because sin actually originated there with Saint with Lucifer. It, uh, it started with him saying, I will be like the most high. Uh -huh. He was thrown from heaven. Yes. So sin originated within the within that realm. Yes. Uh there was a revolt in heaven. That's pretty clear. And uh, a lot of the angels, the, the people we think of as demons now, and yes, there was a revolt in heaven. So sin, uh, as far as we're concerned, as human beings are concerned, sin originated in the garden. But back behind that, there's a time when, when something like a third of the angels revolted against God, led by Lucifer. That's not all crystal clear, but it's uh, I mean, precise in the details of it. But yes, there at some point there was sin before the fall. There was angels going against the will of God. So, to hell? No, they were here on the earth. They're the ones causing all the troubles, all the, the demons and the evil spirits. And well, there's, there's evidence in scripture that they also fought against the good angels and so on, and that is an ongoing struggle. But the, the Bible is not clear about a lot of this. I mean, it's not crystal clear where you can read it and we all can say, yep, that's what it means. It's just not like that. Well, it says there that they shall be a new heaven and a new earth. That's clear enough. So that means that the heaven that is in there now is going to be. There's going to be there's going to be the new Jerusalem is going to descend from the heavens. You remember that great cube, 1200 stadia on each side? That is a massive thing. That is going to descend to earth, and the earth and heaven are going to merge. What heaven really is, is the place where God is. We'll get to see. And, hmm? We'll get to see him. Or did, they, did they see him before he left? Well, it was like an angel. 
with symbolizing the departure of the Lord. It's a pretty clear symbolic language. But, uh, you see, they get into a lot of complexities with this, but uh, there is going to what what the what Jeremiah is saying to the people. There is going to be restoration, and this isn't the end of the nation. There's coming a time when the ark won't be important, when the Lord's throne is going to be in Jerusalem. The Jerusalem itself will be His throne; it will be His city. And that seems to be fulfilled in those prophecies in Revelation. I mean, prophesied again in the book of Revelation. Uh, Isaiah, toward the end of Isaiah, talks about the new heavens and the new earth. Peter talks about the new heavens and the new earth. What I'm trying to emphasize today is that the abode of God, heaven, that we call what we call heaven, where God is, you know, some scientists say it's like another dimension. God is present right here in this room. Yeah, that's and, one and you could go in, it's like another dimension. And God is present, but he's there in that other dimension. Well, physicists can argue about that. I don't care about that, but that's speculation. But there is a place where God is somehow. And that's where we will go at death, but that's not the end. We're going to be resurrected from the dead in order to live on the new earth. And heaven and earth will have merged at that time, so we'll be living a heavenly existence, a fully spiritual existence on the new earth. Is that bothering anybody? No. I thought and thought and thought. I, That's sometimes, sometimes we when we all we sing we all get to heaven and we sing songs as if that's the final destination. Well it's not. Not according to scripture. Uh, where our loved ones are right now is not the final destination. That's not where we're all going to end up. And that's why Jesus, when he ascends into heaven, the scripture says when he ascended to heaven, and he will come back exactly as he left. That means bodily. Jesus will be in bodily form, in that is in bodily form, in heaven. And when heaven and earth merges, we will be in heaven and earth at the same time. And we will be physical beings. That's the way God made us. We're not going to be sitting on clouds strumming harps. Yes, <laughs> we are. I mean, I don't even think we can begin to imagine what this world would look like remade without any sin or the effects of sin in it. Any sea, any ocean. Yeah, that's a puzzle to me. I don't understand that. I, I, I'm sorry, the one that bothers me is looking out to me. I really, really yeah. glad. <laughs> You've got to remember that a lot of that is symbolic language and those things yeah. represent other things. Yeah. And uh, how can you have an earth without mountains and sea? <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't recall that. Uh, yeah, I was when I was teaching Hebrew, I used to think that yeah, everybody's gonna have to learn Hebrew, it's gonna be tough. <laughs> you do, well. I, I hope so because I was never a great language student. Yeah, I can't speak English like that. That's that's part of the problem. I think. Yeah. Well, uh, there is this great promise, and it's 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 just enough to be really tantalizing here, isn't it? We're not told a lot of detail. There's a little bit more when you get down to verse 18, and we'll come back up to the end of verse 17 in a minute. But in those days, again, talking about those days of this prophecy, when this prophecy is fulfilled. In those days, possibly the millennium, the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel. Well, how about that? They've been enemies from the time of Rehoboam after this kingdom split under Solomon's son. Israel warred against Judah many, many times. You go back and read the... Uh, 
first and second Kings or first and second Chronicles, and you, you see Israel and Judah at war a lot of the time. But now they're going to walk together. There's going to be peace. That's what that implied. Peace between the two kingdoms. There'll be peace in that millennial kingdom. They shall come together out of the land of the north to the land that I have given as an inheritance to your fathers. Israel was exiled to the north. Judah was exiled to Babylon, which also would be considered to the north. And someday they're going to be restored and the two nations will walk together. All of the 12 tribes will be merged into one. One people again. Bit difficult, isn't it? Um, but it's, it's tantalizing. It, it just, it's giving you a, it, it's like a, it's not even like a preview on television of a movie. It's just a couple of flashes of what it's going to be. But it's enough to give people hope that God's not done. And one day, Israel and Judah are both going to be restored and become one nation. And there's going to be, they're going to be living in Jerusalem in the very presence of God. And his throne will be, Jerusalem will be called his throne. And that, that'll be wonderful. There's one more thing, and that's at the end of verse 17. They no more shall follow the dictates of their evil hearts. Evil's going to be gone. Well, that's no, that's no earthly prophecy. I mean, regular prophecy. There at the end of verse 17. Well, it shouldn't be at all. It's all people to realize that you stop with violence and look at the way it is. God said that he will, you know, off to all of Israel, he told them, look out over the mountains and be. What you see is what you will inherit. Yes. And they have never inherited all that land. Yes, there it's is. It's got to be sometime, and I'll bet you then. I hope the Lord comes back and believe. In some sense, the land is going to be restored to Israel. But remember in the New Testament, the meek are going to inherit Israel, right? The meek go to Israel. The meek are not going to inherit Israel. They're going to inherit the earth. Because Israel is to be a light to the nations. And that's what happens when, uh, under the apostles, when Jesus sends the apostles out. Because Israel wasn't just for Israel. It was to be a light to the nations. And so... That's why all the nations are going to be streaming to Jerusalem at that point. All the peoples of all the nations, and that, that especially those that have become believers. Now, during the millennium, there will be unbelievers still in the world, likely, it appears. But uh, we're not told a great deal about the millennium either. We kind of have to put it together. This is one of the places we can put it together right here. Well, in the beginning, the language is. Was all the saints. So yeah. is it going to go back that way? I don't know. I don't think it'll be any problem. Like on the day of Pentecost. <laughs> when everybody heard what was being said in their own language. Maybe it'll be like that. You see, what we're talking about here and many other places in prophecy is something that is beyond description. I, I alluded to just a few moments ago about what would this earth be like in its original condition if there had been no sin ever? What would the world be like? No, I've tried to Who knows? I mean, we can't imagine that. You, you and I have never lived one second in a world without sin. You talk about utopia that the liberals all dream about? It's not going to be like their utopia. It's going to be way beyond that. It's going to be a world that is beyond imagination. And I think that at the end of Revelation in chapter 21 and 22, there is a, it is being described in figurative language and in symbolic language that, that just goes beyond. The streets are made of gold and the sidewalks are diamonds and all that kind of stuff. And and uh, there's there's no need for uh, you know we don't need electric company because the Lord's going to be the light of the place and the river flows continually and you can the fruit and all the 
great symbolic language that is taking taking up Old Testament pictures. It's going to be beyond anything we can imagine. Paul says that in one place. We can't even imagine what the future is going to be like. Well, it says, Rain and husband, go ahead. And the house of Judah will walk with the house of Israel. Does it become one tribe then? Well, this is what we have, Bill, so we just have to decide. I, I think it means they're going to be united as one people. Okay. But to call them one tribe, I think it's still be 12 tribes. Just like there were 12 apostles, you know, to go back and look at Revelation, the 12 tribes still exist. But there's also the 12 apostles and um, what they were, the 24 elders and all the, all that symbolism that, that points to, uh, to a continuation of that. What, you know, on Wednesday night, pastors been uh, teaching through the book of Acts, and there were, remember, after Judas died, there were 11 apostles, and they had to choose another one that had been with Jesus from the beginning that was a witness to his resurrection to make it 12. Why? Because they were representative of the new Israel, the new people of God. Not to throw away the old Israel, because they're still involved, but but to but to to talk about the, the, what God is doing in the future. He is recreating his people, which will include Old Testament Israel, Jewish people. Uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't the 12 tribes, they have to be there because of that, at least in my mind, I can see uh, they have to be there because of God leaves 12,000 from each tribe behind. I know, but I'm, I'm talking to uh, well, uh, when he uh, takes his people to yeah, the earth and he leaves 12,000 from each is, tribe. There is all of that, that this seems to be an, an eternal arrangement with these 12, the 12, the number 12. And that it goes beyond that when we talk about the new Israel, the new people of God, that incorporates the Gentiles into Israel. Uh, so this passage is just giving us a, a glimpse of the future. And it's it's giving these people that have just been taught, told about the destruction of the of the nation over and over and over. And if that's far from being done. It's giving them a glimpse of hope. The Messiah is not mentioned other than the in verse 15, I will give you shepherds according to my heart. I think that is a reference to the kings, and the ultimate king would be the Messiah, the Christ. And so, you know, they're, they're looking forward to a time when, wow, it's going to be what it was intended to be. And I think that can be an encouragement to us. And we need to remember that when we read, when we're reading Jeremiah, that the Lord is not done with his people, even with the destruction of the nation, even with the destruction of the temple and the middle of the earth and all of that, the Lord is still at work among his people and going to be. And it's to this day and will be to the end. So I hope that this, this passage has been an encouragement to you. Because at verse 19 and 20, well, really more like 20, but uh, we, we go back to the, you've sure been treacherous, Judah, the house of Israel. Well, we'll be looking at that next week. So God bless all of you, and I'm uh, glad you're here. If you expect that I have answers for all those questions about what the future is going to be, I don't. Do I get a million dollars in the future? What? Do I get a million dollars in the future? Oh, I don't know. No, if you get to heaven, you won't need it. Right. And if things keep going.